I'm going to begin with you, uh, Emma. I was just wondering about the, the research required into, into the world of a kind of high court judge. I mean, I, it's, they're almost, that whole world is almost sort of deliberately elusive. So I'm assuming going into this, you, it wasn't one you knew too much about. No, it's very well hidden. Mm. It's very arcane and was, has, I been, think has been kept mysterious for a purpose. You know, the law, as it, as it developed, became more and more this kind of otherworldly place where you know, almost religious decisions were made. I mean, often they were very much re based on, on, on religion. So it's an ancient and indeed, of course, an entirely patriarchal institution. Um, so that secrecy is Masonic, actually. So uh, for a woman to enter into that world is not only rare uh, and recent, um, but I, I would think quite difficult. You have to be brilliant, I mean, more brilliant than any, anybody, because it's very hard for women even to get onto that ladder towards being a judge. Um, and when you go, as it were, backstage at the courts of justice, it's, it's so ancient. I mean, there's red carpet everywhere, and you're only allowed to walk on the red carpet if you're a judge or a judge's clerk. It's extremely hierarchical and arcane. So... Going into that world was, it gave me so much information about what it's like to have that kind of power. But I'm a woman, so I respond to it differently, I think. How did you come to be involved in, in this project? How, how, how did, did, did um, Ian get in touch with the, the screenplay and the idea of, of one day turning it into no, a movie? No, it's a, a lifetime friendship. Well, mm. lifetime. I mean, we've been friends for 40 years. We made two films together in the 80s, and ever since then we've been talking about another, making another film together. When he started to write The Children Act, he said to me, I think this would make a film. And when he finished writing it, sent me the manuscript, and I said, I agree, I think this would make a wonderful film. Uh, let's do it together, but let's not go immediately to a studio to raise money. Will you write the screenplay? Ian wrote the, the screenplay um, on his own time. Uh, we worked on, and then approached Duncan Kenworthy and asked if he would produce it and then we started to find uh, see if we could find someone that someone being Emma Thompson to to play the, the leading part and without Emma I think the the project wouldn't have got any further than it um, than you know the script mm. and so on the back of Emma and Ian myself Duncan managed to raise the money from several sources New York Finance Company and, and the BBC, and that's how we got the film made. I mean, it must be one of the, the great joys of acting for sort of both of you, that you're always con constantly becoming new people and, and gaining new professions and understanding new worlds. I mean, at, at its core, I mean, it is the world of make-believe. That must be one of the great joys in this, in this whole industry. Oh, yeah. totally, yeah. It's mm. fantastic privilege, really, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Being able to kind of try and understand different characters and studying different personalities is I mean amazing. we got taken into the courts of justice but you blagged your way into a Jehovah's Witness meeting and that's a different thing yeah, yeah. isn't it because yeah. you can either you can either get invited into a different world yeah. or you have to find your way yeah. which you did because you can't say to them oh we're making a film about no. cuz they they would rock quite rightly I think mm. be a bit suspicious mm, I felt so guilty as well oh, especially yeah, as like you know, I went to yeah. I went to a C of E primary school it's yes. like lying in a church, even though I'm not religious. I was like, oh. Do you find now you're out of guilt you're stopping in the street if they if they stand in it with you know, they stand outside tube stations, you're going up there and going, Hi, can you tell me a bit about Jehovah's <laughs> Witnesses? I definitely was when we were doing the film and then kind of run up to the film, um and going into the meeting and the service, like Emma said. That was that was really, really interesting. But I was terrified the whole time. Mm. And every time some every time I got introduced to someone new, they go, Oh, I heard what, what brought you here today? I'd have to re-say it all over again, keep my story straight. <laughs> yeah. What's it like, I mean, adapting a novel? I mean, the pacing is so different. I think it, it's, there's such a different experience to reading a book, to watching a movie. And I'm just wondering about the, the challenges you face in, in, in taking something that is, you know, in, in literature and then bringing it to life on the big screen. Well, uh, I, I think they are two absolutely different media, the fiction and, and film. And they need you need to take that into account. They, you you don't you rarely read a book from beginning to end within a specific time period. Whereas by definition, a film 
has a beginning and an end. You watch it within a specified amount of, of time. And so it's a sort of active um, engagement in the present tense. So the, the dynamic and mo momentum and pulse of the storytelling in film is wholly different from a novel. So that it, it very much, uh, the, we were looking for a way of providing the story with the necessary propulsion. And particularly in the second half of, of the story, that um, changes quite radically from the novel. Because we were obviously speaking yesterday and you were saying about how incredible it was to, to collaborate with, with everyone. So I was wondering, Emma, did you remember in the early stages of your career have any, any, having any collaborations you found quite overwhelming where you were sharing the screen with, with an actor or an actress that you had admired in your sort of youth? Oh, God, yeah. yes, absolutely. I mean, first off, first film I ever made, I think, was um, with Paul Schofield playing my dad in Henry V. And Paul Schofield was just the most wonderful, wonderful man. And um, I was a comedian at the time and I did sketch shows and he'd seen my sketch show. So he, he would quote my oh. sketches, my sketches back at me and we'd snigger like loons. He was such a wonderful man. So he was the first person who taught me what it is to be light on your feet when you are a great actor, which he was. And then Tony Hopkins and Vanessa Redgrave in Howard's End both, you know, exquisite, their behaviour, exquisite, their, their manner of dealing with it and just, just doing it. And I learned so much from them. I was wondering about, the, obviously, the character of Adam. Uh, did, you under, did you understand where he was coming from? I mean, in order to make movies, generally when directing him, do you think you need to have a good grasp of a character's intentions and find the strand of empathy within the characters in order to then make sense of the whole story and direct the, the story that you need to tell? Because I wanted to sort of go into the screen and sort of shake him and say, you know, sort of be an idiot, live, you know. But when do you have to try and find a, a yeah, semblance you, of understanding? I, I was very, very concerned to show that these people, the parents and the Jehovah's Witnesses, are acting in utterly good faith. They believe in these things. I find their beliefs absolutely unacceptable, but not incomprehensible. Um, and I think the job of art or art is to put yourself in the mind of what otherwise you would completely dismiss as, as uh, weird and bizarre and to you inaccessible and incomprehensible. So whether it's a sort of um, Islamic terrorist or whether it's uh, somebody from an extreme Christian background, you have to put yourself in the mind of those people in order to be able to portray them. Do you still get that, still that sort of admiration for fellow actors and actresses when you're, when you're working alongside them? And do you, I mean, and do you think that will, will that ever sort of go away? I hope not. Mm. That'd be terrible, wouldn't it? Mm. God, I'm so bored. Oh, <laughs> he's really great, but, oh, ooh. No, that would be, <laughs> just, you have to go. You have to yeah. go, no, yeah. take your equity guard. Yes, thank you, out, you're out. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, we're going to see the, the King Lear adaptation with Anthony Hopkins from you soon. Uh, just quickly, I mean, there's been so many um, adaptations of Shakespeare's work, but we always look for, for what makes this one unique. How does this stand out from the other stories? I was wondering, this, this particular retelling of King Lear, how, how would you describe it well, as being different? To, to first others? of all, Anthony Hopkins. Mm. Second, it has Jim Broadbent, Jim Carter, uh, Emma Thompson, Emily Watson, um, Andrew Scott, um, so no one famous then? <laughs> so nobody you've ever heard of. No. <laughs> Plus the fact that it's set in the modern world. Mm. And uh, I think it sits very successfully in the modern world as a, uh, a fictional monarch in uh, a, a state, you know, of unspecified, but definitely Britain. Mm. Finn, to move on just a quickly, I'm so excited about Rhodes, obviously with Sebastian Schipper. I mean, mm. I loved Victoria, it was such an incredible movie. Yeah. Uh, what was it like sort of out there filming in the Calais jungle? That must have been quite a unique experience, that one. Uh, it was amazing. We weren't actually in the jungle because mm. there isn't a jungle anymore. I got invited to a set visit and they said, would you like to come to the Calais jungle? So they were just trying to bring me there on false pretenses. No, there is <laughs> still, no, there's totally yeah. still refugees everywhere yeah. in, in Calais and in Dunkirk. But where the actual jungle was is has been mm. raised to the ground. Yeah, raised to the ground. So, but now, what it is now is that these refugees are kind of they've split themselves off into their own, um, into their own groups based on ethnicity, and they've just had to make their own camps themselves. But the police 
um, what they were doing was kind of ripping their tents and everything. Now they're just taking everything and beating them up. It's and terrible. one of the methods they use is they rotate the police in the local area that go around doing that so that they never, um, there's never a possibility that they can form any kind of uh, connection or think too deeply about what they're doing by seeing the same people every day. So once you do it once, you get shipped out to another area. And, um, so it's, it really, really is terrible what's going on. And I think since the, since the jungle and, and since the crisis, and it's kind of died down and it's like people have forgotten, like mm. people have stopped talking about it. But the truth is there is so many displaced people in oh, North yeah. France at the moment, it's get worse. Like so many, and it, it, in such like terrible conditions. And when we when we left France, it was it was October. It was like the beginning or the end of October. I can't remember. It was it was, it was kind of like a, a summer road trip film. Um, we left at the beginning of October, and it was just starting to get cold, and it was freezing at night. And the police have been going around and taking their coats and taking their tents and ripping their tents and. Taking their sleeping bags, it's just cleansing, spraying That's their just sleeping just bags with CS gas, and mm. it's it, yeah, it's terrible. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching. Hey, you guys. Hey, you guys, huh? Hey, you guys, is yeah. that from the Goonies? Yeah. Nice. Hey, you 